Here are two childhood anecdotes about music. So it was 1975 or 1976, I was 11 or 12 years old, and my dad just bought a brand new turntable for the home entertainment system, and it was a dual number 1228. Now those of you who know audio, at the time, if you wanted to lift yourself out of the department store stuff and the mass market Japanese stuff, you usually turn to brands like Duel and Garard. They were a little bit more of a perfectionist audio component. So we did that, and it began what I'm describing as a lifelong troubled relationship with turntables. I have rarely had a turntable that worked perfectly, and this is one of the worst ones. The problem with this turntable is that it would drop the right channel at random times. And sometimes it would drop the right channel for a few seconds, and sometimes it would come back. Other times it would disappear, and you'd have to wait days for the channel to come back. We tried everything. We changed the cartridge. We changed the tone arm cable. We changed the head shell. And eventually we even changed receivers, but it still did the same thing. It would just drop the right channel and you just didn't know. And the problem with that is you could never relax listening to a record because at some point this was gonna to happen to you. Well, around this time, my dad also bought a tape deck and it was this one here from Radio Shack. Look at the price there, the consumer price index somewhere around eight to one from then to around to 2025. It's a big investment. But the turntable drove me to what I'm describing as a lifelong love of the cassette tape. Now today, cassettes, they don't support it anymore. There's a couple of novelty items out there, but nobody really does cassettes anymore. And it's a shame because I really like the format. But I, because of the cassette deck, you could do something. Even though the turntable wasn't working, I would dub every album to a cassette. So what you would do is you would, you know, if there were five tracks on each side of the record, you would do the first track, record it, and then hope that the right channel didn't drop out. And if it didn't, you would just keep going. If it did drop out, you would just wait and then come back and do it again. So in this way, you could sort of work your way through the record. And then once you had the complete album on a cassette tape, you had it and you never had to play the LP again. Now, I was a graphic artist and I still am. I dubbed everything. So, you know, cassettes at the time, they, they, this is a Max L. They, they came with the manufacturer's logo on the outside. So what I would do is there's this thing here. What you would do is you would turn it around like this and there were usually lines on the back and you would turn it backwards and you could write on the, on the edge here what this was. And it works, but you know what? It's ugly, it's clumsy, it's got your handwriting on it. If you made mistakes, you'd see little cross outs on it. It wasn't very elegant. But because I was a graphic artist, I got pretty good at reproducing the album artwork. And this wasn't easy in the 1970s because we didn't have the internet. So what you would have to do on weekends, we would go shopping and I would take a sketch pad with me and I would go to the record section. I would draw what I saw on the, uh, you know, on the record in the store. I can't imagine what the store owner thought this kid was doing. But then I would go home and I would duplicate this. I don't have any of these today, I wish I did. And I don't even remember which albums I did, but I remember one of them that I did do was Band on the Run. And this was a challenge for a couple of reasons. So first of all, most of the time, you know, a vinyl record is a, is a square, uh, you know, image format. So on a cassette, they would usually do the square and then you'd have this ugly white negative space down below. So it's, it's not very sightly. So, you know, as a graphic artist, you would sort of, you know, it was a problem. You could work it out. How would you fill the space and what would be on it? Second problem with, band on the run is the album is very dark so instead of having a white background you have a dark brown background but by then I'd amassed a lot of construction paper and you know uh, manila file folders and the backs of cereal boxes I could match the color and then just do the graphics like this so I had one of these and it looked pretty good it looked just like it's a you know store-bought cassette well one day I was going to an art class and in art class very often they play music while you're doing art and I said, well, I have this tape, it's banned on the run. So we put it in there. And you know, for the hour or so that we were there, I was a popular kid. I was not a popular kid in school, but I got some recognition and kids came up to me and said, I really like that. For someone who did not have a lot of friends, this was very heady stuff indeed. So I got this idea. 
And the idea was, because I was so popular, suddenly I would go home and I would make more copies of Band on the Run, and then I would reduplicate the artwork, like here, so I had a stack of them. Then I would go back to school the next day, and then I would sell those copies of Band on the Run to anybody who wanted them. And I priced them so that I would turn a profit, but not so high that the price was below what you could get it for in a record store. Hey, everybody wins. That one landed me in the principal's office. In 1977, I bought a copy of Sean Cassidy's Born Late album. I was 13 years old or so, and I remember I got it at the Ann and Hope department store in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and I think I paid $3.99 plus tax. Well, my cousins Dan and Ingrid were visiting from New York, and when Dan saw the record, he was incredulous. He said, Ed, why did you buy a Sean Cassidy record? That's a girl's record. It's a teen idol, teeny bopper record. And you know something? I actually liked the record, but as soon as he said it, I realized he was right. Boys do not buy Sean Cassidy records. So I didn't know what to say, so I said, um, no, it was a mistake. And he said, how could it be a mistake? How could you mistakenly buy a Sean Cassidy record? And I, and I said, um, I thought it was Sean Connery. I hate Sean Cassidy. And for the rest of the day, I walked around the house telling everybody, I hate Sean Cassidy. Well, Ingrid, my other cousin, was there, and she felt sorry for me, and she said, I'll tell you what, I feel sorry for the record, I'll give you a dollar for it. And I said, sold, I hate Sean Cassidy. Well, the next day, everybody was out of the house, except for me and Dan, and we're playing records, and he says, why did you buy a Sean Cassidy record? And I said, I told you, it was a mistake, I didn't mean to buy it. And to prove this, I went to Ingrid's room where she had stored the record, and I came back and I said, I hate Sean Cassidy. You know how much I hate Sean Cassidy? I'm gonna prove it to you. So I took the record out, and I took my fingernail, and I scratched one of the tracks with my fingernail. So by this point, Dan's laughing, and the hit single at the time was Hey Dini, and Dan said, scratch Hey Dini. So I looked on the record label, okay, so it's this track. So I took my fingernail, and I scratched Hey Dini as, far, as hard as I could. Now Dan's laughing really hard, he says, don't you have any knives in the kitchen? Well, I came back with a steak knife from the kitchen drawer. And let me tell you, if you've ever tried to carve into a record, it's difficult because the grooves keep directing your knife in a different place. Well, you know, in some ways I was lucky because when they went back to New York, Ingrid did not look at the record until she got back home. And when she did, she wrote me a letter, the contents of which I cannot reveal here. Out of guilt, I sent her $5 so that she could get a new one. I had forgotten all about this story until last week. Dan emailed me, he's living in the Washington DC area, he says, I found the record. And he took a picture of it. And this is what I had done almost 50 years ago. Somehow this album had survived all of the moves that he had done. And you know something, my penmanship is really bad. You can barely read the word sucks. So. I don't know, is this the right time for me to finally admit I actually kind of like the record?